Um, is Cassie Young here, please? Just to ask, are you presenting this evening or is uh, Jim presenting? I will be. Sadly, Jim had another meeting he had to attend. That's fine. It's just so we, we know. Thanks ever so much. No worries. Good evening, members and officers and visitors. I'm uh, Councillor Rowles and I will be chairing the meeting this evening. Um, may I um, ask members and officers who are either in physical attendance or electrical device to mute and avoid feedback. Remote participants keep their cameras and microphones off unless you wish to speak and identify yourselves. The meeting this evening will be recorded for data collection. During the recording of meetings will be re retained for activity and with the council data retention and recorded maybe counters absurd. The following staff are in attendance this evening, physically or remotely. Chief Executive, Head of Regeneration, Economy and De Development, Head of Environment and Leisure, Green Space Manager, Economy and Communication Service Manager, Economic Development Support Officer, Delivery Team Leader, and uh, Democratic Services. Um, the evacuation procedure is um, following for emergency. The visiting members of the public who are unfamiliar with the building procedure. There is no drill due to take place. If the alarm, the alarm sounds ringing of a bell, please use the closest exit, fire the subway. And um, in the event that um, your route is blocked. From the council chamber, the emergency exits um, and secondary exits. The lift must not be used and uh, make your way to the car park. Um, any officer will be to help the aid of the evacuation. Anybody with disabilities, please be make yourself known and um, we will uh, have somebody assist. Um, nobody must leave the assembly area until I, as chair, uh, get, say it's safe for you to return. I now have uh, agenda two, confirming that I will be chairing tonight. Can I have your members' confirmation? Thank you, members. And um, now for the vice chair. Oh, you could ask who's in we are, 
and then anybody with them, then we can right. see Could I have a show of hands for a vote, please? Are those who are in favour? Do I have any? Any abstentions? Sorry. What was the number? Eight in favour. Eight in favour and two abstentions. Okay. Now we go to the vice chair which is uh, Councillor Jackson. And could we have a show of hands for Councillor Jackson to be vice chair? Any against? And any abstentions? Eight in, eight in favour and two abstentions. Do we have any apologies? Yes, we have apologies from Councillor James Hall, uh, from Councillor Elliot Jays and uh, Councillor Derek Carnell is substituting. Um, apologies from Councillor Corey Woodford and Councillor David Simmons. Thank you. Right. And uh, we now go to um, agenda item four, uh, the minutes of the last meeting, the 20th of July. Can I have agreement with members that the minutes are approved? That's anonymous, thank you. Now I have Declarations of uh, interest. Do we have any members of declaration of interest? I'm good or I take that that the that no. Now item six is a update from cabinet. No. Have the member of cabinet. Councillor Harrison. I have one update, Mr. Chairman. We've today agreed the date of the NHS briefing that should have been last year, but there was a little thing called COVID got in the way. 9th of November, and it will be online. Thank you. Do I have any questions from members? Yes, Councillor Gord. Sorry, just on the NHS briefing, is, is that about the NHS in general or anything specific or is it um, and which bodies will be coming to that? It's been so long, these have got, you know, stiff. Um, the overall picture, I mean, last year it was going to be about the um, shadow CCG and the PCNs. PCN and the ICPs, uh, but now it will obviously be a lot firmer um, with changes to the CCG that the entire country is supposed to be going through. So, but it will be more about, um, say, act, actual actual medical stuff rather than some some it could be this and it could be that so the detail of the commissioning of of services for the people across kent and medway will uh, no offense we're not really bothered about medway but it will be about about us and and how services are commissioned um one of my concerns is that if people don't know what what's been commissioned how can you complain that you're not getting the service that that's been commissioned, um, a concern of mine over many years. Uh, I'm pretty sure my, one of my predecessors sitting on my sort of left had the same concern about um, monitoring of contracts 
um, and it's never been very good. So, so if we don't know what we're supposed to be getting and you're not monitoring it, well, in, in my terms, somebody's getting money for old rope. And I, and I think that the more people know, the more councillors know, the more the public know, the better the service will be. Thanks. Thank you. Do I have any other? Yeah, oh, thank you, Chair. I, I, I wasn't too clear what was expected under this item, so I was going to just touch on four or five points um, in so relation to the portfolio, to really, to update you. We had a question on the previous item from the council. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Peel. I just had a um, question for a cabinet member. As much that one hopes specifics DMC on the island, whereas other places around us as well discussed hopefully bring forward some answers. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I would hope so too, because I've um, yesterday wrote in about the, uh, I'd call it a drop in, it's a walk in, where well, you're not actually walking in anymore, you've got to ring up and make an appointment. Uh, that's not what the contract said at all, and that's not what we, has been in the media either. So I, I've got that on. I've got a little list that people have raised with me. Obviously, if, if you all raise them first, then fine. I don't have a problem, but they do need to be raised. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Councillor Saunders. OK, thank you, Chair. So, yes, I, I just wanted, in relation to the environment portfolio, um, I just wanted to highlight to members um, some, some key points. So the, the first is in relation to waste collection, which is perhaps the, the key service within the portfolio. And I think everyone will be aware it's been a, a challenging period uh, because of the national HGV driver shortage. But I think uh, it's very pleasing that, in fact, uh, we've had very little disruption um, to the service in, in Swale. I think we lost one week of, uh, of brown bin uh, collection. Um, it's likely that uh, it's going to, you know, it will remain a challenging period. Uh, everyone is expecting uh, problems with uh, the volume of HGV drivers uh, in the lead up to, to Christmas. Um, Second thing I wanted to just mention was that uh, preparation is well underway for retendering uh, the contract for waste services and the pre-qualification stage is due to start in, in November. Um, and so that will be an opportunity to, to really test the, the nature of the, of the market for, for a fresh uh, contract. Mm -hmm. Third point, um, mobilisation is now taking place for the new grounds maintenance contract and it's very pleasing that we've been able to get improvements uh, in areas like uh, using electric tools and vehicles uh, more, uh, a, a gradual decline in the use of pesticides, uh, a greater frequency of, of collecting uh, waste on green spaces and uh, the introduction of, uh, of the living wage. Um, fourth thing I wanted to mention was that there have been uh, challenges in the uh, projects team, um, but uh, the team's pulling together and uh, has been a successful bid uh, for national funding for, for tree planting. So that's going to be uh, a major activity uh, in the uh, coming months. And to finish off, I just wanted uh, to touch on some good news stories. Uh, there's a green flag award for the all gunpowder works. Uh, there's been some good results in the regional um, RHS in bloom competition and uh, we're continuing to see uh, a rise in garden waste uh, bin uh, subscriptions. So thank you Chair. Thank you. Councillor Baird. Yeah, thank you for indulging me Chairman. Um, in the um, procedure rules for this meeting, the committees will receive concise written updates from cabinet members on current issues and matters of interest within their portfolios. 
Um, I appreciate Councillor Saunders has given an update, but I don't think the Cabinet Member for Health actually did. Thank you. If you'd like me to answer that, Mr Chairman, I brought two yes, items please. here this evening that come under my uh, portfolio. And under the verbal update, I took the view that that was anything that um, was current that needed to be notified to members, such as the date for the members brief in which I notified members of that happened today. So um, there are two substantial items on the agenda from my portfolio, as there was the previous uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Harrison. Are there any other? Questions, current members. Then we go on to agenda item seven. Clear pay areas as the cabinet member for health and wellbeing could report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm presuming that all members have read and digested the report. Um, a couple of points that I wanted to just um, point out really was that um, I inherited the uh, programme from the previous administration who agreed in 2018 to, to have a playground programme. So I inherited the, the programme and the, uh, the financial statement thereof in 18, 19, 19, 20. So, and, and it's it's merely carried on. In years three and four of the previous administration's programme, the bulk of the year three and four uh, proposals would not take place unless match funding was found. Some of the play areas on the sheets to be refurbished are, will be done when 106 money, that is expected, comes down the line. The programme is slightly behind because we had that thing called COVID last year and that put everything uh, put everything backwards. If you were expected to be indoors, um, we couldn't really have staff running around the borough doing inspections and stuff. We don't have, as a lot of councils don't have, projects sitting on the shelf so that if money becomes available, uh, we'll do it. We've never had that sort of resource to do those projects it's always been okay we've got the money so now let's let's draw up a project for said said site so thank you thank you councillor harrison councillor about a time now yeah question yeah, we, we missed out a update from the climate and ecological emergency i don't know whether you want to finish this item before I go to last go back. We'll finish this item and come back. Do I have any questions? Sorry, there was, my apologies, uh, Mr Chairman. There was one other thing as as well as the questions that are in the report before you. The other thing which um, re relates to previous experience with Councillor Simmons is if there if there are any play areas in your patch which are continually vandalised such that the cost to this council and and obviously every one of us through the council tax um, is is going up and up and up. Is there any of er, any play areas in your patch that you think, well, let's give in and shut it? Perhaps give in and shut it is, is the wrong terminology, but I had one that was costing £15,000 a year to repair. Um, and in the end, I believe it's Councillor Simmons at the time shut it. He did after a, no a number of years reopen it and touch wood, we've had nothing since. But it, it just as fast as we were repairing things, they were just getting vandalised. So whilst you don't want to say, well, let's give in to them, we don't have the money to keep spending that that sort of money every year on, on a particular area that is vandalised as soon as it's, it's put back to rights. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. 
Yes, I see on operational um, inspections on a quarterly basis, each play area is visited by a green space maintenance and inspection officer. Um, would it not be appropriate perhaps for the ward councillors to be informed when they're going to be doing this and then perhaps the ward councillor could join them and point out what they've noticed is wrong in the play parks? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davy. Councillor yeah. Davy. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Etcher. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, do you want one at a time or all in, all in one go, Councillor Harrison? All together. Okay. Um, uh, you, you touched on um, the <clears throat> the chance that a lot of the players weren't inspected during uh, lockdown. Uh, so have all the inspections up to uh, been got up to date now? It's one of the questions. Uh, bottom of page six, you got about uh, the decision in 2018 <clears throat> to no longer expect responsibility of players on new developments. Um, now, I've already raised the issues on the new Abbey estate by Morrison's, um, but they now appear, uh, I believe, as breach of planning, such as rubbish bins not being emptied. I walked through tonight again to double check. There's three trip hazards still there where there were these, uh, well, giant metal balls bolted to the floor. Three of them, they've gone and the spigots remain. Um, this has been raised on a couple of occasions. Um, and I wonder how we could keep pressure on uh, the developers when they build these estates out and put players on them to maintain them to the standard that the rest of the play areas uh, are kept up to. And uh, in reference to the vandalised sites, obviously we had a site taken out in Denby Close in Milton. Um, have you any idea what the plans are for the vacant land there? Because there was talk of there being trees there that some of the residents weren't happy with. I don't, you may not be aware of the site, but there's uh, the old play site and then on the other side there's some uh, scrubland in effect. Um, and so it'd be nice if we could have an update on any plans for those two sites. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Mr Chairman. On uh, members joining inspections with officers, I'd, I'd have to leave that to Mr Cassell. Um, my personal view is that they uh, officers have a a program um, that they, you know, sometimes change at the last minute because because things come up and I think it might be very difficult for uh, and time consuming to organise things so that members can actually join them on their inspections which is quite regular. On uh, Councillor Davy, obviously during the very first lockdown, all play areas as instructed by the government were locked. Um, as soon as we were told that we could reopen them, they were, in, every one of them was inspected. Um, any sharp edges, all, all the normal inspection stuff, sharp edges is, is, is filed down screws loose, all the rest of it, so that they were up to scratch before any of the public were, were allowed in them and they were opened on a gradual basis. They weren't all opened on the same day. Uh, new developments. And uh, No, I think um, I think I'd probably be told, well, that's up to a private developer, it's up to the council. Um, but, you know, maybe there is something there whereby we ask them if they do certain standards if we're expected to stick to st certain standards on our play areas then i would would have thought that private developers were also expected to but M mr cassell might um might look at that and on the denby close there was something about trees i have to declare an interest here um some of my colleagues would quite happily put trees on every bit of spare space um, but i think that's still being looked at and obviously nothing will go in if the residents surrounding it are very anti. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Do we have any other? Yeah, um, uh, just a couple of things to add to, to Councillor Harrison. Um, Councillor Jackson, all, all, we're always happy to meet ward councillors at, at sites. Um, it might not be practical, as Councillor Harrison says, to do it on their standard work round, um, but we've certainly done it before and, and we're more than happy to, to um, meet on site and, and go through those. Um, 
are they all up to date? Yes, they they were all up to date anyway. We only had a very short hiatus of, um, as Councillor Harrison said, where they were locked. Um, it gave us an opportunity while they were locked. And once there was a clarification from government that mobile workers could still go out, um, it gave us actually a really good opportunity with empty playgrounds to go out and do a lot of improvement um, and, and refurbishment work. So, so that was good. Um, open space strategy. Yeah, Councillor Harrison's right. Clearly, um, it, it sits with the management company of, of the site, but they are um, they have the same responsibilities um, under the various legislation and guidelines as we do as a council. So they should be undertaking the, the same repairs to, to playgrounds and inspections. Um, and um, yeah, ha how far we take it, we can certainly write and make those management companies uh, aware of um, the issues that are within, within their sites or residents can as well. Um, in terms of the Denby plans, I'd love to have a conversation outside of the meeting, um, Councillor Davey, I wasn't aware that there was some resistance to the tree planting. Actually, myself and the team have been working on that tree planting plan this week, funnily enough. Um, so um, so that's that will be useful information to have and we can take that offline. Yes, Councillor Davey. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Martin. Um, on the uh, developers, uh, maintenance of play areas. Obviously, we expect them to stick to the same standards, but I was told that it has to be reported as a breach of planning because it's a condition of the planning in the first place. So we have to sit behind the planning department chasing up the breach. Obviously, the area that I've highlighted has been like that for months and it's still the same, still trip hazards in a, in a public walk area, even though it's a, technically a private estate if they're still maintaining the grounds. And um, as far as Denby goes, Tony and I were due to go out, sorry, Councillor Winkless and I were due to go out, do a door to door because there was some resistance uh, on social media as trees would provide hiding places for people because it was a notorious uh, dealing area in the past and uh, they're worried that it may, they, they, they are complaining of cars parking up the end of Denby anyway um, and so they're worried that it will, the old problem will come back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Councillor Davy. Um, questions are: Is are we providing the right level of play area for the borough? Do you agree the method of rag rating proposed refurbishment? Are there missed sites of the members feel? Councillor Nicholas Hams. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, clearly, the report focuses on like the play areas that the council has responsibility for, and that's absolutely right. But there are a number of play areas within the borough that will be owned either by parish councils or maybe some community interest group. And I just wondered, you know, what the um, cabinet member is thinking of doing to help promote. Um, the ability for them to provide new equipment, for example. So, you know, they may be compliant with all the regulations that they need to fulfil, but when it comes to providing new play equipment due to their budgetary pressures, they just might not be able to do the improvements or the additional equipment that they'd like to see um, unless they get significant um, Section 106 um, contributions. With that in mind, would the council look at a scheme of maybe some sort of secured drawdown facility um, whereby it has the potential to and provide a new revenue stream um, to the council with limited risk, whilst at the same time allowing these other organisations and groups that manage play areas in the borough to maybe have the um, high, you know, the range of equipment they would like to, to see but can't actually do on a, an annual basis because of the financial constraints that they have. I'm not entirely sure that I understood the question. Um, are you are you saying that we should provide a fund for um, different groups to to bid for to improve their facilities? Not all of the um, facilities are parish town council. Uh, there's housing association ones, quite a few of those. Um, you will be as aware as I am that uh, whereas uh, councils can precept you know, four pound ninety nine or fiver. 
or five percent, whichever is the higher. Parish and town councils could precept 150 percent if that was their wish, because there is no restrictions on precepting by those authorities. Having said that, one parish, par yeah, parish council. Um, I think it was last year, towards the end of last year. Um, off its own back, I think they got some money from Faversham Town, a Faversham Area Committee or or Eastern Area Committee, whatever it's called, yeah, um, to put in adult, outdoor play equipment, outdoor play equipment. So, so they are most of them are actually looking at it, and um, certainly I know one of the Optivo ones that that is now I've pursued because some of the wood is getting a bit well it's, it's probably not as safe as when it was put in wood wood wears away you know you, you don't kids climbing on it and then it collapsing so I, I know that certainly optivo do go around the play areas that are their responsibility and, and look at them on a regular basis but they like everybody else's strapped for funding thanks Thank you, Councillor uh, Council Martin. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, when, it, when it comes to the question of already providing a lot level of play in areas in the borough, I think we should always keep a, uh, a, a, an eye on we had major house building over the last few decades, and we're still talking about the same sort of play areas that have been here for the last years. So, so there's lots of uh, open areas being built in, in lots of house in our social housing bill that don't, don't actually determine them to be play areas there's no equipment so i think um, i want to assume it's adequate because the population of inch over technical availability to use that's what i feel um and also we can't expect services to the maintenance program to them using the finance it because they're no longer in the area so we have to be aware that the uh, the council has control and maintain the new areas, boxes, make provision of entry for other new areas to keep up with the population increase. That's my view. Thank you, Councillor Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The policy of the council, um, it was in this report, probably when it was done. But anyway, the policy of the council a few years back was that we will no longer, if a developer builds a play area, um, what they used to do was they build it, they'd give us 10 years commuted sum for the maintenance of it, and then that was the end of it. And what happened after that is that the Swellborough Council budget had to be found to provide, to pay for all the things that these developers had put in. And the council made a decision, of, I say a few years back, could have been 10 years back, made a decision that they would no longer accept play areas from developers. If developers want to put a play area in, then they have got to continue the maintenance of it ad infinitum. The, the council would not take over responsibility at any time for it. And there are a number of those and it is down, as Councillor Davies just said about one, it's down to, to the developer through planning, if it was a planning condition, to make sure that it's kept up to scratch. But this council decided um, some years ago that it was not going to take on because what was happening was uh, members would be sitting here saying, well, we'd like to do this and we'd like to do that. And they were told, well, no, you can't do that because the budget is taken over by all by basically looking after things that were given to us. But we've then then got to look after the funding off. So the council policy was that we wouldn't take over any more um, sites from developers. It is up to um, planning to decide if there's a big development as part of the 106. And we know there's a problem on 106 on the Isle of Sheppey because oh, we can't afford anything. Um, but it is through 106 agreements that, that we should be getting the facilities and benefits for our residents, for the houses that are coming into their areas. And of course, facilities for the new people that are moving into the new houses. Um, but that, that clearly rests with planning to make sure that they do it. And as I say, they used to say, well, you pay for a play area and give us a, a sum of money for the next 10 years worth of maintenance. 
Uh, and what we said some years ago was we're not going to do that. We think there should be a play area in X place and it's your responsibility to maintain it ad infinitum. Don't think you're going to palm it off onto the council. I'm sure they didn't use those words, palm it off onto the council, but but that was the implication of it. Um, it is a hell of a cost. I mean, you've you've read the report, you've seen all the different inspections that that our people, our staff have to do week in, week out, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, and all the rest of it. And as well as all of that, there's the old Zurich report um, inspection to make sure that we're doing our inspections properly, to make sure it's all up to scratch, so that if there is a problem, we're covered by insurance. And knowing all the stuff we do for ours, that is really what developers should be doing for theirs, developers, parish councils, um, housing associations. So I would say, the policy of the council some years ago. I don't think the appetite has changed to actually say, no, 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 give, no, we'll put loads more in because and and you know as well as I do Here's another one that. You can agree a 106 and then it'll be well when the 59th house comes in, you've got to build a. A play area. We know Power Station Road was built many many years before that play area actually came in i would say a good 10 years after the last house was it you know people moved in a good 10 years before that play area then came along and all those people that moved in thinking there was going to be a play area their kids probably going to university by the time it was put in thank you i'm aware of the cost implications Thank you. Oh. Thank, thanks, Chair. The only thing I'll add to, to that one, and then I'll come back to Councillor Hampshire's uh, question, um, was um, we've got a gentleman called Graham Tuff that's on the, virtually on the call. He's our uh, Green Spaces Manager. He's involved in every planning application, so he gives commentary to, um, to the planning department around what is required in relation to, to that particular development. Whilst we don't take on the new full playgrounds, we do often give the opportunity for them to continue to give a Section 106 agreement to add to existing playgrounds. It's much easier um, and, and better to do that where you get end up getting bigger and better playgrounds, um, but also um, within a walk catchment. So we have all of the play, play areas mapped onto our GIS system and we're able to look at the walking catchments around those um, to show whether there is enough uh, enough demand for, for exactly that new housing, Councillor Marchington. So we there is quite a science behind the feedback that we give to, to the planners through, through each of those major developments. Thank you, Marty. Um, coming back to Councillor Hampshire's question, I, I also am not sure that I totally understood it because my ears pricked up when you said it's a revenue stream that I can make money on Councillor Hampshire, so I'm, I'm definitely intrigued. Um, in terms of what we do to encourage the parishes, so very similarly, if, if there's a development in a parish um, and actually we would benefit from the, con the Section 106 contribution to go to that parish council, um, facility rather than ours. We do we do still we act as the broker, but we we pass that over to the parish. So we're always on the lookout for for supporting parishes in, in terms of that. You talked about a secure drawdown scheme. I'd, I'd love to either net, not now or, or outside of the meeting talk about that and understand that a little bit better. Thank you, Marty. Essentially, if you don't mind, you would um, provide a loan facility, say to the provider which they could draw down against um, or alternatively you just do like a standard loan with the interest being the revenue stream to the council after a various um, vetting of who you're giving the money to and it could be a secured loan for example over the assets of the, the, the borrower. It's what goes on in the farming industry. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. Captain Yes. Um... On questions, are there any sites missed off that members feel they should get attention? I just wondered why Whiting Crescent, the most deprived road in Faversham, not the ward, but the road, has absolutely nothing on the green space down at the bottom of Whiting Crescent, which I think, Martin, you've been out to see, was left in a terrible um, state from the uh, builders, the building at the back. Um, perhaps you could answer that question. What? 
I'm racking my brains to uh, to re remind that site, so I might need to refer to, to Graham if he's uh, in the background, who will uh, have a bit more history on that. But the name certainly rings a bell, Councillor Jackson. So if we can't tonight, we'll take that away and um, come back to you. Sorry, am I able to interject? Um, with, with White and Crescent, surely I thought there was sort of play equipment behind the back of the community centre. Um, but also there's the field down the bottom um, on the estate, which it's is the field. Yeah, which, which I think needs to have a big green space and all there is is a bin and a bench. And those poor people had that taken away and there was yeah. Paris fencing put up because of the, I think, is it balls? The building of the new houses in Watling Ward at yeah. the back. Now, a young mother spoke to me and she said, my children cannot go up to West Community playing field. They're too young. And this is young people around there deprived area. Yeah. I'm, I'm, fa I'm fa very well aware of writing Crescent and where it is. For their children to play on down there. Yeah, no, I mean, so you've got the big open field. I think there used to be some goalposts or something there, but I, I do think it's an area that has, you know, quite some social issues and maybe something that for the community safety group to, to look at what they could do um, to make the area safer. Because the last thing you want to do is put council play equipment into an area where it's just instantly going to be vandalised, is what the cabinet member has just said. So, you know, it's, I think it's going to need a joined up approach to that one. Thank you, Councillor Adger. Councillor Jackson. Do we have any other questions? No? Then uh, if we could go back to Councillor Valentine, the, which we missed out. Councillor okay. Valentine. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, an update on the climate and ecological emergency portfolio. Um, so, Swell Borough Council have been invited to join UK 100, which is a network of highly ambitious local government leaders, which seeks to devise and implement plans for the transition to clean energy that are ambitious, cost effective, and take the public and business with them. Um, so, it's nice to uh, know that our ambition in this area is being recognised. Um, another example of that is that the Wilder Carbon project that we've involved in again we've been invited to join we're the only borough council in kent involved with this it's a project spanning essex kent and east sussex looking at uh, nature-based solutions for offsetting um, carbon emissions um, so that involves kcc as well and uh, we look forward to uh, working with kent wildlife trust on that um, we're also developing plans for car clubs. Um, so this is the idea of having a, a shared shared vehicles in an area. Um, the information we're given from the providers is that on average a, a car club car displaces nine other cars from the road um, and their car club members are more likely to make journeys by walking, cycling, and using public transport for for those journeys where they can can use those methods but they've got an access to a car um, for, for when they need one without having to own a car. Um, I think the big advantage of this is that with our desire to make a modal shift in the way journeys are made in Swale and get people out of their cars, a big problem to that or a big barrier to that is that um, if you own a car, you've got a lot invested in that. You've paid a lot up front to have that car, to tax it on the road, to maintain it, and therefore it becomes um, you know, cheaper or it appears to be cheaper to, to use it um, as much as possible. Um, so I think car clubs are an interesting idea that we, we are keen to try. Uh, we're planning to start with one in Faversham um, and uh, and then hopefully we'll extend it to other areas of the borough. And this might be a way in which we can use um, Section 106 for air quality from developments by being able to put a car club um, cars on the on the development uh, to encourage uh, the new residents not, not necessarily to feel they have to own a car. Um, we have a business events um, which will be launching uh, green business grants, uh, which is taking place on the 3rd of November. This will be in the Light Cinema, um, and it's uh, be launched by uh, the Cabinet Member for the uh, Economy uh, and myself. 
Um, so this is um, recovery funding um, where we'll be encouraging businesses to be able to use um, the, the grants to um, uh, green their businesses as they um, recover from the pandemic. There is, of course, uh, COP26 coming up in Glasgow, the UN International um, Climate Negotiations. I'll be attending for the last three days of that conference and I'll be attending a uh, an event hosted by UK 100 and representing Swell Borough Council there. Um, Anthony Idling uh, legislation has progressed well. Wardens are all trained up. Signs are already up. You may have noticed them in some areas of the boroughs. So, for example, outside schools, railway stations, where there's an idling problem, um, we're waiting to get some more publicity out on that. Uh, we continue to work on the low emission zone. Um, we're at, at the moment we're at, we need to engage with KCC to find with, the, with them as being the highways authority. We need to find out um, what will be possible um, working in collaboration with them. Um, and something we hope to be taking forward shortly. Um, and an EV charging strategy is under development and that will be coming forward um, to uh, the, the committees towards the uh, end of this year, beginning of, of next year. Championing active travel is also within my portfolio, um, but we've got an item on that later on the agenda, so I'll, I'll leave that for that item. That's all I have to say, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Valentine. Yeah. Councillor Davey. Thank you, Councillor Valentine. A um, couple of questions there. On the on the car clubs, um, could you give some idea how, how they're kind of funded, how you go about having the car, how it's stored? Do you try and use electric vehicles um, and uh, Obviously, it's down to the users then to negotiate who gets it and when. But I wondered if you could give me an idea on that. And uh, on the the business funding um, event on the third November, are you sending out invitations to that, or um, is it just going to be, you know, via the website? How are we uh, going to get the businesses involved with that? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Davy. If I take your second question first. Um, I think that's been out. I mean, it's more economic development that are organising it than the climate emergency portfolio. But I think that's gone out through their um, newsletters to businesses. Um, and I know the majority of the places are already taken. We've got a few left. Um, and. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's gone well so far on the car clubs. Um, the, the model we have there is that so, for example, what we what we have in mind at, at Faversham is that there might be uh, there'd be three car clubs. Um, they'd be uh, sorry, three cars. Um, they'd be in relatively central locations in the town. Um, the so car club members join the club. Um, they might pay a small fee, a small fixed annual fee, but that will be low. And then they they when they rent the car, they pay by the hour or by the day um, for, for, for the use of the car. Um, what we're planning is, I mean, we'd love them all to be EVs, um, but it's, that's a little bit more difficult to, to do. What we're hoping to do is have one EV and two hybrid cars um, initially in, in Faversham. Um, the EV would have to have its own dedicated charger in, in one of our car parks, so there'd be dedicated space for that, that particular car. The hybrids, um, they can either have dedicated parking spaces or they can use a geo fence so that you could be left anywhere within a, a constrained area. Um, and it will all be booked um, and accessed through through an app. In fact, you even open the car, I think, through the app. Um, so uh, th that's essentially how it how it works. Oh, yeah. Um, so the obviously car club provides the vehicles. So what we, we are doing is we're going to have to provide some funding up front for the uh, for the cars to, to get the thing going. The, the hope is so the funding we're talking about would cover it for three years and our, our ambition is that it would then be self-funding. So it wouldn't be an ongoing cost of council. I just wonder about the uh, anti-idling. Um, uh, if there are, are areas that you know, we feel might benefit from that, 
is there a process for flagging those up or um, how, how are they the uh, sites chosen? Yeah, um, we we have um, we have put this out to parish councils, I believe. So we've had we have gone come some sites have come in through sort of local nominations. So if you let me or Martin know of areas that you have in mind, um, we'd be happy to look at them. Chair and our members. Martin, you have any? Nothing to add. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arantine. Um, we now go on to agenda item eight, which is cycling, walking. Um, can I have the cabinet member for health and wellbeing give a report? I'm sorry, Chair, this is me again. Oh, got it under the thank you, Councillor. I agree. It could, there are lots of portfolios this could come under, um, but we quite recently decided to put it under the um, climate. Um, if you'll bear with me a moment while I just find the right page. So this is this is updating our guidance on um, walking and cycling. Um, as you see, so we've got a statement that is uh, expires next year. Um, and so the report is asking um, uh, sort of for input into where where we think um, this statement should go, how ambitious it should be and so on. Um, there are a number of initiatives. There's actually quite a lot going on in this this area now and a number of um, rather separate initiatives that are listed in the report. So there's the Fav Favisham Local Cycling and Walking Infrastructure Plan, uh, which has been funded by Swale Borough Council, but is um, being uh, carried out by, or the lead is by um, Favisham Town Council, some consultants. There's the Linking Coast to Downs project, which is a, um, a project through the Kent Downs uh, AONB, which is about um, identifying routes, which as it says, from, from the coast to the uh, to the Kent Downs. Um, we've got some projects that have come through uh, area committees. The Eastern Area Committee have uh, started a project called Town to Parishes to uh, walking and cycling routes that link the, the outlying villages into the into the town in, in Faversham. The Western Area Committee um, have a similar route for walking and cycling routes. Um, into obviously at the western end of, of Swale and we've got the Natural England Coastal Path which is uh, just um, being fully uh, adopted. Um, so as you see at the end of the report there are some general questions that we're interested in um, seeking advice on. I, I think we've got Lynn Newton on the call. I don't know if she wants to come in and add anything to what I've said. Um, Councillor Valentine, I was going to defer to Chris Blanford on this occasion, but I'm happy to take anything on the Interreg Experience Kent Downs project should it arise, but I, I prefer to pass over to Chris if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, thanks, Lynn. Uh, I, yeah, I just, I just wanted to add um, that the, um, the, the most important thing to bear in mind about the guidance statement is that our role is to influence and lobby um, Kent County Council because they're the responsible highways authority for cycling and walking. So a lot of the um, the strategy, the kind of the aim of it is to sort of persuade and influence. Um, and it also it's about supporting town and parish councils as well. Um, just kind of as well to show that we're willing um, and sort of open to improving the cycling and walking network um, and in the past that's had a positive effect so uh, when we adopted this uh, guidance statement um, Kent County Council were happy to um, award us some funding that we could go towards the Faversham and Sheppey um, cycling and walking audits so that's the kind of the reason why um, why we have the guidance statement. Thanks. Thank you Chris. Councillor appear. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with the statement. It's all very good. Um, and that hopefully lobbies KCC. There is a link here, um, especially with all the building going. The link between the planning and builders are actually blocking rights of way. 
Now it's happened on my patch, actually, three, three occasions. I've gone through the case and seen the four for everything else. And in one, one occasion, they actually managed to come down the open. Didn't reinstate the style because they put a fence up because they're starting to starting to build. And the planning hasn't been agreed building, but they're blocking off the entrances so the walkers can't go down that way. And that's happened two or three times now. Um, we always used to blame the farmers um, for stopping the walker trains. Now it's the builders. Now that is Swalbower Council's uh, responsibility, um, be it the right of way or case and see. Somebody help. Um, I could, well, I mean, thanks for raising the issue, and I agree it shouldn't be happening. Um, I don't really see how it's Swalborough Council's responsibility. It's um, their public rights of way. Kent County Council have the public rights of way officers, um, and it should be down to KCC to ensure that they remain clear. Yes, thank you. Um, it becomes Swalborough Council's problem, planning, because they, uh, they, they allow the planning to go ahead without putting conditions on it. Um, and presumably, listen to KCC. There needs to be a dialogue here where effectively plan, the, the planners and the developers can't go on willy nilly blocking all these routes. There's are three major ones on the island, to my knowledge, and I'm quite sure across Swale is equally ones being blocked by developers. So that's Swale Borough Council's responsibility in ensuring that. Uh, there are conditions put on the planning before the developers actually start developing. Well, well, I agree they shouldn't be blocked, and um, I can't imagine that planning permissions would give permission for rights of way to be blocked. Uh, are you saying they just block them without? Yeah. yeah. So that's not an answer, is it? Yeah, I quite agree with you. Thank you, Captain Nichols. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the, the Cabinet Member for in Environment has spoken a lot about um, the car sharing scheme that he's wanting to bring forward. Um, I just wondered whether he's given any attention to maybe a similar bike rental scheme. Um, it could have immense benefits, not just for health and wellbeing, but for promoting sort of tourist attractions or local businesses with a coordinated, you know, cycle route um, guide uh, as well. And I, I just can't seem to see any mention of that within the document, but I, I may have missed it. Uh, yeah, we have considered it. Uh, actually, a sort of a bike rental scheme is a lot more expensive to set up than a than a car club. Um, uh, which is one of the barriers to them, but it is something that um, we've got on our long list of actions to do for the climate emergency. And um, there is the possibility of some government funding coming forward for for e-bike rental schemes, and um, we would, um, you know, when that comes forward, that's something we would hope to bid for. The only reason why I asked was, I mean, I, I appreciate it may be slightly more expensive to, to, to set up because you'd have much more stations, for example, that you'd need to put in place. But surely the benefit, potential benefit would be much greater because, you know, if you've got three cars, realistically, that's maybe three or six households that are going to get a benefit on any given day. Whereas, you know, if you've got 10 bikes, that bike might be used an hour over six hours that could benefit 60 people. So actually, its benefit is much wider. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I agree. I, I mean, it's not an either or. We'd like to do both of them. Um, I'm not sure I'm, uh, you know, about the relative benefits. I think the advantage of the car clubs is that it can displace cars. For, it can encourage people not to own cars. Um, and, and that fundamentally is the problem that we've got to get fewer cars on the roads, you know, get get some of the cars off the roads. They're already there. Um, but I, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of having bike rental schemes, and I'd love to do it. Uh, it's just we don't have unlimited funding. We have to, um, you know, pick a strategy and follow it. Um, but I'm certainly not against e-bikes or ordinary bike rental schemes. I'd uh, I'd love to see them. 
so uh, if I could, through you, Chair, um, I was at Brighton when we set up the Brighton Bike Scheme, um, which you will probably know lots of green bikes all over Brighton, uh, huge usage, one of the highest usage and real concerns about the cost uh, due to bike maintenance, bikes going missing. Um, and, you know, it is something that in order for uh, there has to be a really strong business case just because the costs of the bike seem the benefits are there there is no question about that um, but in a student city with lots of students using Brighton bikes and visitors um, still there was real issues over the um, over the cost of the whole cost of it and getting bikes back to where they need to be um, and again in, in somewhere that's quite contained like Brighton if we were to do it here it's how you get so you have to get the bikes back lots of maintenance lots of costs so I think it's something if the council were to do um, we would have to look very very carefully and find a partner to do it with and that would be potentially the challenge would be to find a partner that would could uh, help set up a scheme um, in somewhere in one of our towns uh, because of the football and we don't have the thing. But I think there are the benefits there, certainly. Councillor Davey. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, I'd like to revisit the, the previous item. I didn't want to interrupt the flow, but something occurred to me. Um, on the anti idling um, you, you say you've added certain areas already. Rather than us message you up and say, what about this, what about this? Have you done like the fast food areas and the high streets, obviously outside of schools, which are a, a big problem, as we already know. And uh, I do have a question on, on the PRO uh, Ws. Um, what um, pressure do we have on KCC? So I noticed they've got this um, improvement to their public rights away. I think it's 2018, 2028, but um, again, I have to use my own experience. I, I, I've been trying to get a PRO a W cleared of rubbish and uh, overgrown vegetation for several months now, and it's still the same, um, despite me putting it in two or three times, <coughs> excuse me, two or three times to KCC and also the divisional member. And then that obviously raised the issue with the new Northwest development where the, the bridge across the railway line is planned because you, you're going to have plenty of people walking through from Northwest development into sitting warm, but the, the bridge may not be built for several years again after the, the development's been uh, completed or at least partly occupied. Um, so again, how uh, can we bring, is there any way we can put pressure onto uh, network rail uh, to get this done in advance, because obviously they've still got the Simpsons crossing closed, which is causing some consternation. And uh, they're not looking at putting in any uh, improvements. I mean, we managed to get the whistleboards removed on the two uh, on the two crossings we had in Milton. Um, but they're, they're, um, this is network rail, their argument against uh, putting in local warning systems is the cost. You know, they said about eight hundred and fifty thousand pounds to put in a, a local audio visual warning system. So, is there anything we can do as a council to put pressure on on both these organisations to improve the PROWs as promised, and obviously to, uh, you know, if we want people to walk from the new developments, we need to have them safe. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think you're kind of taking me rather out of my portfolio. <laughs> if you don't mind me saying, I think these are really planning issues rather than okay. than climate emergency issues. Um, but you know, I've every every sympathy with the issues you raise. Um, uh, you know, the public rights away are our KCC's responsibility, um, and all we can do is is lobby them to to improve the service. Thank you. Mr Chairman, can, can we ask um, the of, um, officers to, to pass along to the planning committee because, or planning department, because um, some bodies, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but some bodies are very good at, at, at passing, oh it's not us, it's Swell. Oh no, that's Swalborough Council, that's Swalborough Council. And if we can get the planning department to, to do what they can or in terms of um, planning conditions uh, and that we can um, uphill, uphold, 
then we can separate out that actually the PRO W is, you know, we've done our bit. It's now down to you to to do the PROW bit because from my remembrance of the PROW Act, um, it doesn't matter who's blocking a right away, whether it's whether it's a local councillor, a local developer, I don't know, the High Sheriff of Kent. You are bound by the same rules. Everybody's bound by the same rules. And, you know, I know everybody's short of staff and everybody's trying to do their best, but you can't just say, oh, no, that's no do of us, that's them. A public right of way comes under Kent County Council and it is their responsibility to keep it clear. And as Council Pew said, we used to have the problems of the farmers and we've all worked together to hopefully get that sorted out. Um, but just because Swell is the planning authority, you can't say, oh, no, it's developers, that's down to you. So if we can get the planning department to do everything in their power, then we'll find out, you know, then we can get on to the PRO people and say, right, we've done everything we can under law. It's now down to you. Because otherwise, they will continue this, this pass in the buck ad infinitum. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Harrison. Councillor Thornton's question. Okay. Um, I I just wanted to speak really as a visiting member chair on this uh, item. I'm I'm very interested in issues around cycling and walking. And in fact, I'm the the chair of the um, Faversham Local Cycling and Walking Infrastructure Plan uh, Working Group. Um, the I mean the original guidance statement, which isn't in the papers, I think is is quite outdated now um, because government policy has changed quite dramatically in the last four or five years. And there's, there's you know, a key document like gear change, uh, which isn't referenced in our in our statement. So I think in answer to one of the questions here, I think it. it this, the original statement does very much need to be um, up, updated and it needs to reflect, I think, you know, that there's a shift towards um, thinking about cycling and, walk, uh, cycling and walking and active travel in the context of the fact that we, we need to encourage everyone to do more of this rather than it being a, a distinct um, activity, you know, that people go off in Lycra to do or put on walking boots to to do so I think it's quite um, fundamental that this this is reviewed um, I also from my experience in Faversham feel it's very important that we are as a borough council um, prepared to push and lobby um, KCC because certainly our experience as a town council in Faversham has been that uh, um, because we campaigned and because we've developed plans, KCC have come forward and put money into the town for the 20 mile an hour scheme and they're now uh, uh, you know, suggesting that they're, if they're successful in, in bids to the DFT, they'll put in uh, uh, funding for, for further uh, pedestrian improvements. So I think it's important that the council is proactive uh, on this uh, and that uh, this strategy is, is reviewed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gordon. Councillor Gord. Thank you, Chairman. It's really building on, on that point about um, you know whether a focus of the strategy needs to be for that sort of pump priming, that that preparation of, of plans. You know, we can because I get the impression that KCC is it, it's such a big area. You know, their their active travel strategy um, recently highlighted I think it was four routes over the whole of Kent you know it was it you know they, I don't think they have the capability or, or the um, local knowledge to actually push for for the routes that are needed and, and I think it's a question or, although it is their responsibility in terms of um, implementing these things and and um, you know, maintaining them and everything in terms of the identification of, of routes the identification of a network the even the working up of, of proposals, as, as Councillor Thornton has um, mentioned, I, I feel that's a very important part of the strategy so that when funding comes along and you know, there's every indication that there will be more tranches of funding, we're there and ready with something that we can say, look, 
do this, do this in swale. We're, we're ready to do it. And, and I think you know that that needs to be almost sort of written into the to the strategy that we know what's needed. You know, it's particularly around the requirements, for example, on, on the uh, the gear change, the, the local transport note from last year, and and are actively preparing as far as we can within the resources that we've got um, items so that it can you know just be ready and waiting for, for, for the funds to, to, to come along. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Martin, do you have a question? Uh, just uh, referring back to the rights of way in this situation, um, but the going right of way has to be quite KCC. Um, we've kind of Three rights of way in Washington are they built and they've been down, they've been sealed up for several years. So they have to put them back. Uh, and they can only close them when it's like a danger to public health. It has to be already lifted, they're going to go back. Uh, another instance is they closed the sea wall, they boot out from Quimba for some years while they were doing the wall. Closed it six months. They have to come back again. The other way of where it's been using uh, routes for some, a certain number of years. It might not necessarily be a right of way. It's up to the individual's concern to, to uh, put We can contest um, developers, but they have to maintain a right of way just because it was not a official right of way, because it's been in general use for seven years. So it, it, that's something we can help our constituents when they vote that. If it does become a personal thing, someone has to actually apply the right to do it if it's not an official. I just put it back to what it's Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pierre. Just very briefly, just to say the ones that I have highlighted do actually have KCC rights of way numbers because that's how I managed to get the KCC to get them to buy something. Thank you, Councillor Pierre. Do our officers have any? Uh, Then we go on to Councillor Saunders with the uh, on images. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I'll, I'll just briefly introduce this and then uh, uh, either uh, Martin Cassell or uh, Kerry Houghton, who's on the call, um, can probably give you uh, more of a, uh, an introduction. Um, obviously, cemeteries are a very uh, key uh, thing that uh, the council looks out uh, looks after. Um, at the moment, we have a very out of date set of regulations for them, and uh, work has been going on with the national um, body uh, that um, uh, looks after standards um, in in uh, cemetery management to uh, update uh, these uh, standards, which uh, uh, are over 25 years uh, old now. Um, so uh, we felt it was important to bring it to this group because it's about uh, um, the public's experience uh, when they uh, visit uh, cemeteries and it would be very helpful to get uh, any feedback from uh, members of the, of the committee uh, in relation to what's here. Um, the only other thing I'll mention is that uh, because we have a new cemetery at I Wade, which has been, as I understand it, built to slightly different standards to older cemeteries, there are some sp uh, specific provisions uh, in relation to that cemetery. But I'll hand over to uh, uh, Mr Cassell um, if there's anything else to be uh, added. Thank you, Councillor Saunders. Thank you, Chair, for, for, for you. Very little to, to add. Um, so what you see in front of you is actually um, uh, almost the draft cabinet report, um, very much in the old PDRC style. So we're looking for this committee to, to, to give commentary on the regulations. They're very much there to control how people use the cemeteries. Um, we have to get that balance between freedom of access um, but obviously some control to, to help us reduce antisocial behaviour and obviously help us to, to maintain the cemeteries. Um, we uh, have picked up a number of issues over the years, obviously, as they get fuller. 
Um, you know, that brings new challenges in. So we've updated elements of the regulations around that. And as Councillor Saunders said, having just recently um, made our first burials in the Iwade Cemetery due to sitting bourne and, and halfway cemeteries being um, all but full for, for reopens. Um, and so there are some site specific elements added around Iwade Cemetery um, within the new regulations. So um, this is part of its onward journey to, to Cabinet for approval and would welcome committee comments. Thank you, Martin. Are there any other questions? <coughs> Councillor Davy. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> no question. I just like to thank the officers for a very thorough report. And um, I've learned an awful lot just reading it. Uh, stuff that I didn't know uh, the, the regulations. You often see posts on Facebook, people going, oh, someone's taken this away and we put that there. Now you know the reasons why. So I think um, once it's through and the public made aware, they'll be uh, much better informed. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Councillor Davy. Any other questions? Oh, um, is there a, a an idea of how long the Iway Cemetery will, how much, how long the provision of that cemetery will, will last for? I think I'd better take that one, Chair. Um, I have, I, I get often get criticised in in my team for obviously having a fairly matter of the fact way of talking about cemeteries so apologies if if i do do that clearly they're a very emotional subject and um you know as councillor saunders said um very important for for residents to to be able to utilize um we can only make um estimates on what previous burial rates have been um and at the moment we because it's taking bookings from what would have been halfway and sitting born we're estimating a 10-year life cycle for for i wade at the moment finding space for um additional cemeteries is is very difficult and and clearly something that we try to do through local plan um, or through taking available sites um, in, in close proximity to existing sites, but clearly sites are um, generally outpriced based upon development value. Um, so it, it does become a difficult issue. We continually look at um, the planning process in order to secure more, but currently we're estimating we've got a good amount of um, capacity within Faversham um, as well, which is our cemetery. So. Yeah, about 10 years is the, the short answer, but clearly burial rates um, vary from year to year. Thank you, Marty. Councillor Stevens. Um, I'm aware that in the, there are private um, woodland burial sites. Has the council considered having any woodland sites um, that could be used? Because there are people that really want alternatives to a, a cemetery itself. Yeah, really, really, really good question. Um, we we tend to prefer to to allow the range of of options. Obviously, um, we we as a council could go into some, uh, crematorium operation, but clearly the private sector pro provide that facility well. And it's the same with the the woodland sites or the natural bur burial sites. It is really just back to that availability of suitable land um, to be able to do that, Sarah. So never say never, but it's not something we've we've currently looked at. Do you have any other, other questions? Uh, then we go on to early childhood development from is that Councillor Harris? I believe um, the chief executive was going to introduce this one, um, Mr. Mm. Chairman, being as she's um, had previous experience. So um, thank you. Um, I think part of the reason I've been asked is because I've now got to share my screen, so um, my technical skills can be put to the test. Um, uh, members will probably be aware that we've been working with the Seashells Children's Centre um, to uh, run an early childhood development pilot project. So uh, we're 
I would like to welcome Cassie Young from the uh, Seashells to uh, give us a presentation on exactly how that pilot project is going. Um, I apologise if it's going to take me a second to see this. Um, so um, if members can see that, uh, Cassie, when you would like uh, slides to move, just do your Chris Whitty bit and ask me for the next slide and I'll see what I can do. So if I hand over to Cassie, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Casey uh, Young, sorry. <laughs> my mum chose my, the spelling of my name. I get that, I've had that all my life. Um, so I am the Early Childhood, uh, Childhood Development Coordinator at Seashells. Um, I will apologise, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this, so I'm a little bit nervous. Um, so I was employed back in June, basically, to take on this project. Um, and so far it's going really, really well. But if, if I could have the next slide, that would be amazing and we'll get going. Um, so during the pandemic, it was identified that families struggled with isolation, education, job loss, obviously lead, uh, leading to lack of income, hunger, keeping healthy and much more. Uh, the longer children are left unsupported, the greater the risk of them not attending school and obviously reduced job prospects, leading them to be caught in the poverty trap. Um, and this is the type of cycle that we want to break. And we feel if we can address children's health, childhood development, and educational inequalities early enough, then we can start to create a brighter future for children and all families. Um, at Children and Families, we have always used a holistic family approach uh, to enable families to meet their care requirements and to raise expectations and empower them to change their lives and make a difference to their community. I can I have the next slide, please? Um, so uh, from reviewing Swaborough Council's Health and Wellbeing Improvement Plan, we felt that our project complements their aims and their aspirations to improve the health, um, health inequalities and put healthier com uh, communities at the heart of our project. Public Health England data from 2018 for SWAL reveals that levels of health and deprivation that were significantly worse than the England average um, in the following areas, um, which are children in poverty, long term unemployment, smoking status at the time of delivery, breastfeeding initiation, under 18 conceptions and smoking prevalence in adults. Um, come over the next slide, please. Um, so through my previous employment, um, basically I've worked in nurseries within um, Sheerness. So I, I was able to work closely with families living in one of the most deprived areas in Kent. Um, so working within the nursery allowed me to identify the needs of children living in these areas and dealing with the daily struggles that life throws at them. Um, so as I said previously, I was recruited as the Early Childhood Development Coordinator back in June. Um, my main focus has been to understand the local area and, and its needs, basically, um, as well as I can do. Um, so I've begun to ensure a holistic and coordinated approach to young children's health and wellbeing. Um, so basically, you know, as, as I'm sure we all know, that early years education has the hugest impact on the life chances um, of disadvantaged children. Um, so exposure to enriching environments and professionals that are able to enhance and provide the opportunities for them to learn, thrive and just in general experience, you know, have these experiences that others are able to. Um, it's just so important and obviously the parent, uh, parental support and the home learning environment also have a huge eff effect on the child's life chances as well, um, which is one of the reasons that we promote and we provide key health and wellbeing programmes, um, as well as create ways of learning, um, as learn of learning as a family, sorry, um, promote new ideas and support families to learn in a new and enjoyable and clear way. Um, and hopefully that will really impact the bridging, um, the gap between affluence and poverty, which obviously is one of the biggest aims. Um, through our groups and support work, um, I've ensured that our wonderful team are sharing information and guidance about healthy eating and the benefits of good quality foods and what that they have on us and our children 
and equally the importance of physical activity and the impact it has on our physical and mental health. So we offer a range of events to families across the island. Uh, we're known for our beep, beep events, I don't know if anyone's heard of them, um, which are based, based around road safety. Um, but they're just so much fun with so many opportunities for our local children. And the last session we did, which I believe was the end of June, um, we, we, we reached 118 five to seven year olds with working with the schools, uh, the local schools, which was amazing. Um, and I also played an active role in delivering the Reconnect programme, which comprised of six large events based around many different aspects of learning. Um, and we actually reached 232 children and 154 adults from across the island. Um, the feedback we had was absolutely amazing um, from children, families and professionals alike. Um, so we was really, really proud of that um, and the impact that that, that um, extra funding did give us for the families locally. Um, can I have my next slide, please? Um, so we're continuously strengthening our partnerships, working with health visitors, midwives and GPs. Um, we've recently supported the reopening of the breastfeeding drop-in clinic for families across the island. Um, and alongside, uh, uh, sorry, alongside this, we recognise that parents with young babies have had a really hard time during the pandemic um, and maybe have missed the support that many of us have taken for granted previously. I know, you know, when I had my son, I had so much support, um, as did many of us, but um, recently, obviously, young um, new parents haven't had that at all, which is really sad. Um, so alongside the breastfeeding clinic, we've decided to run an under one stay and play group, which is an opportunity for the parents to get together, to share tips and experience, uh, experiences between themselves. Um, and we have two very experienced team members as well that are offering support and guidance on a variety of topics and that they're able to um, signpost if necessary as well, if they need some extra support. Um, but this has become extremely popular. I think it's only the third week we've been running it um, and it's been full every single week um, from families across the island. I think this, this last week we only had three families from Sheerness and the rest were from across the rest of the island. So that reach is really good. Um, our sensory hub as well um, is extremely popular, sometimes being fully booked up to a month in advance. Um, we, we're using an individualised approach across 15 sessions per week, um, which currently I am looking into increasing due to its popularity. Um, and obviously across all of this, one of our main focuses is safeguarding the children within the local community. All of our staff are trained to a high standard to recognise and act on anything that would be a cause for concern within a family. And we'll offer our own support as well as refer to the appropriate professionals if that's obviously what's required. Um, can I have my next slide, please? Um, so, so far we've had much better relationships with our families um, since going back face to face. Um, many of families are so grateful for what we've offered them and they're so vocal about um, how much our groups and programmes have helped their mental health and their wellbeing, leading to them having new aspirations and goals for their future. Um, through our group delivery, we'll be um, tracking a group of children through observations um, basically to monitor their learning and development, uh, development within their early years um, and just to see um, if there's any areas that need extra work or extra support, um, etc. moving forward. Um, additionally, our community pantry is hugely popular. I'm sure some of you have heard about that. Um, and across the island, um, we've got a whopping 148 members um, that come every week to collect some um, good quality, healthy food. And obviously we're giving out tips about um, meals they could um, cook and make for their families as well with that food. Um, we also did the HAF um, programme um, through the summer, the holidays, holidays, activities and food. Um, we actually had 32 children sign up um, for this and over a four week programme, we offered them food, which they prepared themselves as well. Um, and provided lots of fun activities to keep them busy through the summer. So that went down really, really well. Um, can I have my next slide, please? Um, so basically, um, 
it, it was amazing how many families were just so desperate for the help and support um, coming from across the island and actually beyond due to quite a lot of the other children's centres remaining closed. We were one of the only ones that remained open um, through the pandemic. Obviously, a lot of the work we did at the time was virtually, but we've been back face to face since March. Um, there's been such an impact on children's learning and experiences which impacts their own mental health and well-being. And obviously, if you just looking at the slide, you can see a lot of the other key findings we found um, in general, really, you know, lots of barriers with families and so many more increased safeguarding concerns for children and young people, um, part, you know, since the pandemic as well. Um, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so moving forward, obviously, we're really happy with how, you know, how the project's going so far. We've we've done a lot, lots of things, um, but moving forward, we would like to resume home visits. Um, at the moment, obviously, due to the pandemic, many of our staff didn't feel safe going into homes at the moment. So we're inviting people into the children's centre um, and we're also sort of meeting them out and about, going for walks, etc. if they need somebody to talk to. Um, but we would like to improve that journey for parents with newborns as well by linking up further with the mid midwife etc and um, we do plan on running some uh, antenatal and postnatal courses as well we've got some dates in them for uh, i think it's the end of the end of november i think we're going to start some of those as well so hopefully that will all build into that um we are working with other professionals as well to reduce the teenage conception rates um, and we've got this really good opportunity to support the Sheppey support bus as well, which is um, with our um, family finance officer and our home and fuel um, workers been working quite closely with them at the moment. And we're, we're looking at some other opportunities as well there to help further the um, support we can offer families and children um, around the island, you know, when they maybe can't come to us, we can possibly go to them. Um, and we've actually started a new, well, we will be starting a new project in a couple of weeks time, um, which is via the playground project and star catchers, which is a focus on nought to twos and bringing lots of um, arts and crafts into it and musical, um, uh, musical arts as well. Uh, we did a training this morning so there will be a variety of artists coming in every week so it'll be a session every Thursday afternoon um, a variety of lead artists and support artists as well so they'll be encouraging families to express themselves through many different arts and just showing them how to do lots of different things of instruments using the equipment they've got around them to make music and sound and express themselves through mark making etc so we're really excited about that um, and I'm hopeful to learn a lot more about that in the coming weeks. Um, thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Councillor Haberson. Go on. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, ever since, um, well, since the beginning, since it was a pile of mud, um, I have been involved in children and families, as has another colleague in the room. And I can't speak highly enough of an organisation that sees a need and then says, right, what can we do about it? Uh, and that's and that's where we came up with this. I happened to be down there one day and um, I was talking to the chief exec about different things. And, and he said, well, this is one of the things we really think needs doing on the island. I have been a councillor for quite a number of years and, and all the time I've been on here, it's been Sheppey's really deprived, Sheerness is really deprived. We really need to do something about it. You know, I mean, you know, this I'm not having to go at anyone. It's just all of us together. We've never actually it's such a big issue. Um, but but children and families see a need and then say, right, let's what can we do about it? And then having got a project, it's well, OK, where can we get the money from rather than let's get some money and, and then find a way of spending it. Um, and, and this not long after cabinet colleagues agreed to fund this pilot project. We were here first, by the way. Um, I read in the media that a certain Duchess of Cambridge was also going to be doing something along these lines. And I thought, oh, yeah, you're following us, you know, we're setting the trend. So, you know, it is really key. 
And I know it's, you know, it's not exactly the same thing, but many, many years ago when we started on the recycling trail, we decided that the only way to get recycling going was to catch, catch them young. And we did catch them young. And we had our staff dress up as Arnie the Aardvark and all sorts of other things. And it got the kids and, and you've got, you know, that is where you've got to get in. And the only way to make a difference on the problems in Sheerness and across the island is, is to actually get them in down right down there. Pre, prenatal, antenatal and postnatal. And then, you know, give them the right tools to actually develop in the right way. And not just the, the children, but the parents as well. You know, the breakdown of the family structure, you don't have grannies and granddads near you anymore. And, well, you know, that is a, that is a whole different rant about de um, deprivation and, you know, people who were put on the, the scrap heap and then their family was put on the scrap heap forever and a day, you know, it, it does make a difference. And so this is a pilot project. It can't help everyone. But as um, Casey, because I kept saying Cassie, Casey said, um, it isn't just Sheerness, it is actually the reaches across the island. Um, and that's what we need, need it to be. And, you know, this it's making a difference already. It will continue to make a difference. As, as, as I say, the Duchess of Cambridge took this up after we start, after we agreed this project. So there's got to be something there. She followed us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Davy. Oh. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Casey, uh, for the presentation. Just like a bit of explanation on how um, engagement is initially made, say with newborns, uh, do you get information via NHS or is it purely through networking? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Careful. So it's actually basically from networking, really. We're lucky enough to have some NHS offices within Seashells Children's Centre. So we have midwives and health visitors with us every day or the majority of days um, working. Um, so they actually provide the parents with information um, about us and our services and it's it's a huge, well, it's an incredible link really. Um, so yeah, so through networking. Thank you. Councillor Gould. Thank you, uh, Casey. It sounds a you know, really wonderful project. And, uh, but it, the one thing that strikes me is, is, is that this was a lot of what health physicists used to do uh, I think a few years years ago, but it and and sure start centres as well. Uh, do you feel you're sort of filling the gap that that has been left as these services have declined? Um, I mean, I think you know, I think it's, it sounds a fantastic set of uh, activities that you're doing, but uh, I'm just wondering whether whether you get that that feeling. Um, I think absolutely, really. Um, I don't know if we're doing everything absolutely that they were. I don't know exactly what they were doing from start to finish of their day, etc. But um, we are definitely filling some kind of gap there with these families. You know, there's such a need for that extra support and um, well, just guidance, really. You know, so many families aren't aware of of the information that's out there to keep themselves healthy and safe, etc. Um, so, yeah, we are definitely filling some kind of gap there, I would say. Thank you. Marty. Oh, sorry. Councillor Jackson. Thank you, Casey. Um, do you have a waiting list or is it just, you know, when they're referred, they can immediately be seen by you? It depends on the referral, actually, because a lot of a lot of the things that we do are just walk in. You know, you could somebody could walk off, uh, walk in off of the street and say, I need somebody to talk to. I need some help. And we would always, always make sure that somebody is there to talk to them and support them and guide them in the right direction. Um, we do have um, an in-house referral system to our um, family support workers. So that would just be a referral form. And then within a couple of days, somebody would get back to them. But if, if anybody was in any kind of distress, they could literally just call us or walk in and we will always find somebody to help them. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stevens. Um, 
I'm an, actually an ex-local midwife, um, so this is so I can see this where you're filling lots of gaps. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, how did any women approach you after miscarriage or pregnancy loss? Because they were, must have, through the pandemic been in a terrible state because um, they probably couldn't access any of the support they would normally have got. So um, did you have any incidents like that? Just be interesting to know as I wasn't a specialist in that field. <laughs> Oh no, I can absolutely see your interest in that. Personally, I don't know of anybody um, that did come in asking that, but again, I'm not privy to everybody's caseload, etc. So I'm not saying that hasn't happened. I've just not been made aware of that, but I can most definitely find out. That would be great. Thank you. I'd really be interested to know. You're welcome. Are there any questions? Martin? Thank you, Chair. I mean, this is probably uh, against uh, procedure, uh, but th um, as a visitor, uh, Casey, I just wondered if you'd had any engagement with our leisure centres at all. Actually, no, no, not not personally. I haven't. No. OK, um, I'd, I'd love to have that conversation and see how, how we can link link that up. And then my final plea is um, you, you might have, I'm, I'm not sure when you joined the call, but you might have heard the discussion around play areas. Um, yes. Just wondered if you had groups where we could potentially pose some questions in a sort of focus group way around um, how the playgrounds currently meet their, their needs. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely um, discuss that further. Um, I'm happy for you to email me or anything and we can have a chat about that and get some ideas moving. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. You're welcome. Oh, sorry. Councillor Gold. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I probably ought to know this, but how long is, is the sort of pilot being funded for by Swale and um, what are the sort of plans, you know, down the line? Um, or is that sort of the future and we don't know it sort of thing? <laughs> a little bit of both, really. I think the, the project is funded for a year um, and then obviously it will depend on how that project goes and, you know, what will happen then after or thereafter. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Casey, for joining us this evening. It's You're been welcome. educational discussion. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Members, I think that closes our meeting tonight at 20 to 9. Thank you members for a very good meeting. Thank you. Thank you.